This is the first video of four on human evolution. My emphasis is on how rapid it has been and the fact it's still going on. It's a latter that's controversial. Since the time of the Scopes Monkey Trial 80 years ago, liberals have berated conservatives as knuckle-dragging primitives who don't believe in evolution. Now it's the liberals who don't. They like to pretend there has been no evolution since the human race migrated out of Africa 50,000 years ago. No, it has speeded up dramatically. But that's in videos to come. Video 1 covers the period up through our ape ancestors 7 million years ago. I'm telling the story in seven timelines, each about one-tenth as long as the preceding one. In my subjective opinion, each timeline represents about the same amount of evolution, at least insofar as we can regard humans as the end product of evolution. Evolution is the process by which the genetic makeup of a population changes over time. It's caused by differential rates of reproduction. The genome of organisms that produce the most offspring will, over time, dominate the gene pool of the population. Populations evolve into separate species as their gene pools become sufficiently different that they can no longer interbreed. As those species in turn continue to evolve, we classify them in increasingly high order clades, genus, family, order, phylum, and kingdom. Life appeared within the first billion years after the Earth was formed. Life is determined by metabolism and reproduction. Self-replication can be as simple as an ice crystal seeding another one. Metabolism defines an entity that absorbs foodstuffs, operates on it chemically to derive energy, and leaves behind waste. At any rate, within its first billion years, life on Earth had evolved into cells with walls and internal organelles. A scant half billion years later, photosynthesis appeared. Blue-green algae were able to use sunlight to create simple sugars. This put oxygen in the air and created food for predators and decomposers. Somewhat less than a billion years ago, the cells came together into multicellular life. 600 million years ago, in what is called the Cambrian Explosion, those life forms had become complex enough to leave fossils visible to the naked eyes of the first paleontologist. Worm-like things got buried in mud and left fossils. Some of those worms developed legs, antennae, tentacles, claws, and so on. About a half billion years ago, plants colonized the land. There was now food for animals on land. Plants evolved rapidly and filled the atmosphere with vastly more oxygen for animals to breathe. Some worms developed backbones and became fish. Two kinds, spike finned and lobe finned. Those lobe fins turned into arms and legs as amphibians crawled out onto land. They in turn evolved into reptiles, which no longer had to return to water to lay eggs. Reptiles reigned for a couple hundred million years, during which time birds evolved from dinosaurs and mammals from more primitive reptiles. Plants evolved quickly, flowering plants proliferating during the time of the dinosaurs. Plants, because their seeds and spores can survive a long time, endured climate change, especially the great extinctions, better than animal species. Since multicellular life appeared, there have been five great extinctions, killing as many as 90% of all species of land animals. The primary cause appears to be tremendous volcanic activity, filling the atmosphere with dust, first cutting out sunlight, and then heating the world with vast amounts of carbon dioxide. The last but not the greatest appears to have been caused by a meteor strike in the Gulf of Mexico. It triggered lava flows in India. Dinosaurs, cold-blooded animals with big appetites, died out. Small, warm-blooded mammals and birds survived. They inherited a world in which the ecological niches which had been occupied by dinosaurs were empty. They evolved rapidly to fill those niches. Mammals evolved into small herbivores like rodents, big ones with hooves, marine ones like whales, and airborne ones like bats. Our ancestors, the primates, took over the treetops. They developed color vision for finding ripe food, hands for grabbing trees and food, great coordination for navigating the treetops, 
and brains capable of sustaining a complex social order. Abundant food allowed small monkeys to grow into large apes. Instead of balancing on top of branches, their shoulders evolved to allow them to swing underneath them. Their brains and the complexity of their social order grew. As a measure of the speed of evolutionary time, it's worth noting that all species of cat, from tiger to tabby cat, evolved more recently than the apes. Dogs, likewise. By the time we parted company from our forest cousin seven million years ago, we had become highly social apes, still adept at climbing trees but big and fierce enough to live confidently on the forest floor. Though we had evolved quickly, the most dramatic changes were yet to come. Evolution speeded up. The underlying cause of genetic variability has been fairly constant. It's mostly due to cosmic radiation and copying errors as the DNA double helix splits and reproduces itself. It's what nature does with that variability that has changed. A more complex genome will experience proportionately more random mutations. Sexual reproduction guarantees that offspring are not like parents and usually not like each other. Smarter, faster, hardier individuals will leave more offspring. That's evolution. Changes in environment prompt evolution. Life moved onto land. Environment changes more dramatically on land than in the oceans, especially during the great extinctions. Organisms coexist in a biosphere. Each species is forced to evolve as its prey and predators change. As the antelope speed up, so must the lions. Some animals, like beavers, modify their own environment. Humans do so dramatically. There is competition within species, especially among humans. One tribe may develop better technology and better weapons. We breed selectively. People are very picky in choosing our lifetime partners. We breed our animals selectively. Some of them have changed dramatically just within our lifetimes. Some groups of people have bred themselves to be especially intelligent, like the Jews, the Parsis, and the Japanese. Humans are led by culture and ideas. The Muslim culture believes in having children more than the Christians. The Muslims are being evolutionarily successful. Evolution is an amoral process. It has no purpose, no objective, no predetermined end. The idea that humans are the end product of evolution is a human conceit. The mechanism of evolution is reproduction. The genes of the organism that are most successful in reproducing themselves come to dominate the gene pool. The act of reproduction is entirely instinctual in every organism other than man. Every healthy organism will attempt to reproduce itself, and any that does not would, by definition, not be the fittest. Humans are naturally endowed with libido, a sex drive, but we have been attempting since ancient times to control our fertility. We drove a natural birth control pill, a psyllium plant, to extinction in Roman times. Technology has made us much more effective. The declining impact of religion and other mechanisms that controlled our mores has broadened the number of sec acceptable sexual outlets. Lower libido has served human evolutionary ends and encouraged intact families, ones that would devote their resources to raising children. Unlike other animals, humans evolved social devices for increasing our fertility. North Asians have low libido but traditionally impose high social pressure on young adults to marry and form families. 20th century society has destroyed those social structures leaving them with insufficient impetus to marry and have kids. We used to live among families, clans, and tribes that shared our genome to one extent or another. They had an evolutionary interest in the success of our families. They could be counted on to help raise and defend our children. Now, neighbors in big cities have no evolutionary stake in our children. Families are usually far away. We are on our own. Humans evolved to avoid work. This drove us to all the inventions that improved our productivity, which is good. However, children entail work. My observation is merely this. If we take the point of view that the human being is the end product of evolution, then we can say that evolution has speeded up dramatically. My second video addresses human evolution up to the age of agriculture. It was very rapid. 
of what has happened since the dawn of civilization is truly explosive. The third video describes human evolution in the age of agriculture, the era of civilization, and the fourth describes its amazing progress first forward and then backwards, at least to those with an enlightened notion of indirected evolution, in the last millennium. This is the second in a series of four videos on human evolution. It starts with the separation of humanoids from our ape cousins and ends with the beginning of agriculture. Our ancestors split off about seven million years ago. A drier climate put pressure on our forest-dwelling ape ancestors. Some of them ventured out into the grassland, the African savanna. They evolved to cope with the new environment. They began to walk upright, even to run. No longer used for knuckle walking on the forest floor, hands became free to grip things. Our shoulders evolved so we could throw overhand. Australopithecus, the famous Lucy, no longer had to depend on just hands and teeth to defend herself. She and her mate could throw rocks and sticks at both prey and animals that would prey upon them. A little more evolution, and our hands with opposable thumbs were up to the task of wielding a club or using a rock as a hammer. Arms and shoulders evolved to handle the shock of pounding. Once we started throwing things, and especially pounding things, our brains started to change. We developed handedness. We tended to throw things with one hand, usually the right one. Two million years ago, at the dawn of the old Stone Age, Homo erectus would be holding a rock with his left hand and knocking chips off with a rock in his right until he had crafted a stone axe. We tamed fire. At first it was useful for driving game and clearing land where game animals lived. Then we learned to cook, softening our food. Our jaws got weaker. After millennia of gesturing with our hands, we learned to communicate by symbolic speech. This development set Homo sapiens apart from other hominids. Brain growth accelerated to support new skills, from 350 milliliters for chimpanzees to 400 for Lucy, exploding to 1.2 liters by the time we left Africa. Most remarkable was the acceleration of the rate of brain growth, from 83 millionths of a percent per generation up to three one-thousandths of a percent per generation, a thirty-fold increase in the rate of brain growth. There is a surprising consensus that Homo sapiens started speaking only about 200,000 years ago. That's only the last three percent of humanoids' time on Earth. In evolutionary terms, it's remarkably recent. All observers agree that our amazing powers of speech are closely related to the amazing versatility of our hands. Left brain, right brain separation applies to both our hands and our speech. The sign languages, spontaneously evolved by the deaf, involve the same kinds of abstractions and grammatical rules as verbal speech. Little related to speech fossilizes. Much of what scientists have concluded is a matter of conjecture. But there is evidence that the changes in our throats and larynx required to support speech date from about this time. Those changes are otherwise not helpful. Our throat design, for example, now lets us choke. It must have been for speech. It appears that the brain wiring for communication started to change fairly rapidly as well. Also about this time, scientists make a case that all other hominids, intelligent and social animals that they were, had become good at communicating through gestures. Homo sapiens was simply the first to master verbal communications, which are much faster and more versatile. It offered a huge evolutionary advantage, one which was soon put to use in driving our fellow hominids to extinction. It also modified our social environments, leading to even more accelerated evolution. We were somewhat modern, Body allows DNA indicates that we started wearing clothes not too long after we mastered speech. We had spread throughout the African continent and no doubt established dominance 
over every wild animal. The major factor limiting our expansion would have been habitat. Hunter-gatherers need a lot of land, about five square kilometers apiece. Population would have been curtailed by warfare among human groups as much as by predation and disease. Looking for more habitat, we spread northward in a major wave about 50,000 years ago, although there is DNA evidence that a few pioneers had left earlier. The so-called Paleolithic Revolution took place about the time we left Africa. There was a marked increase not only in the quality of the stone tools, but the tempo with which they continued to improve. Artwork, jewelry, and cosmetics appear in the archaeological record as well. It was cold up north. We learned to sew clothing. We developed better weapons. Tying rocks to sticks gave us spears and then bows and arrows. We started weaving and braiding fabric. We started building houses to shelter ourselves from the cold. Among the first to appear were mammoth bone huts here in Ukraine. The pace of innovation stepped up rapidly. Everything kept getting better. Eventually, we got smart enough to figure it was better to have our food come to us instead of going to it. That was the dawn of the age of agriculture. There were several species of humanoid throughout most of this period. Most famous were the Neanderthals, but there were also Denisovans, Peking man, and the recently discovered Indonesian Hobbit man. Although evolution is a continual process with no clear demarcations, scientists have chosen 400,000 years ago as the date that Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens was an African species, and for the next 350,000 years, its evolution was confined to Africa. Homo sapiens migration out of Africa spread us to the rest of the world in fairly short order. We encountered other prehistoric humanoids along the way. Maps of migration out of Africa vary, but all agree on this high-level pattern. Our ancestors went north through the Near East and then spread. The ones that went north from there adapted to survive Ice Age winters. There was a lot to eat, especially mammoth. We met and mixed with other humanoids. The European genome is perhaps 2% Neanderthal. There are Denisovan genes in Asian populations. The Homo sapiens immigrants were forced to learn new skills. They became adept at group hunting. Planning ahead for the long winter led to building shelters and sewing warm clothing. The cousins they left behind in Africa were not forced to make such adaptations. It is hypothesized that the northern branch split about 30,000 years ago, somewhere north of the Himalaya Mountains. Those heading west became the ancestors of modern Europeans. Those going east, the northern Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. Other populations spread eastward along the southern route through India, merging with those who had gone north. Those who took the southern route included the ancestors of the Australian Aborigines, who somehow reached that continent despite having to cross large stretches of open ocean. The Semitic people went westward. As we spread, other species of humanoids went extinct. Some of the northern Asian people kept on going eastward, spreading across Siberia to Alaska, becoming the first humanoids in the New World. They peopled the Americas about 15,000 years ago. These graphics are conceptual, showing high-level flows. The most important point is that by 10,000 years ago, our population had grown to 5 million, from 10,000 at the beginning of the hominid epoch. That's not bad. It represents an increase of about three one-hundredths of one percent per generation and we had wiped out all other species of humanoids. Our ancestors had populated most of the niches suitable for hunting and gathering. It was time for something new. That something new was agriculture. That is the story for the next video. This is the third presentation in a series of four 
on human evolution. It covers the period from 10,000 years ago, the dawn of agriculture, up to 1,000 years ago. The first presentation covered the period up to the split between humans and our ape cousins, 7 million years ago, and the second covered human progress up to the age of agriculture. This one covers a period from the advent of agriculture up through the past millennium, the time at which Western civilization spread to dominate the earth. The key point is that evolution has been accelerating over the entire history of life on earth. Factors that speeded it up include sexual reproduction, the move from ocean onto land, competition with other species, and especially a species' ability to change its own environment. Human beings have always been masters at changing our environment. The rate at which we did so increased dramatically with agriculture. The traits that determine human reproductive success changed with the environment. Agriculture and other changes spurred by it has profoundly affected the traits that lead to our reproductive success. This video will briefly recap the changes that have been brought about since the advent of civilization. Human nature changed profoundly, but those changes did not affect all human populations uniformly. Some came to agriculture later than others, and some had no exposure to it whatsoever until Western Europe's age of exploration, starting four centuries ago. Thus, some, in, some human populations reflect the outcome of 10 millennia of intense natural selection brought on by agriculture and civilization, and others do not. The unsurprising but politically awkward result is that they are markedly different in almost every measurable way. Bone deep, not just skin deep, as some would like to pretend. Let's recap where the world was 10,000 years ago, just warming up coming out of the Younger Dryas Ice Age. Human beings had spread to every habitable part of the Earth. We had driven a lot of large animal species, our sources of protein, to extinction. Over significant chunks of our habitat, the human population of 5 million or so had expanded up to carrying capacity. If children were to prosper, they needed to take land from each other or figure out some better way to make use of the land they had. That better way was agriculture. The beginning of agriculture was generally placed in the Fertile Crescent, stretching from the Lower Nile River to Mesopotamia, that name meaning the area between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The soil was fertile, watered by annual floods and amenable to the domestication of plants already growing in those areas. The small dark green spots in this movie show the spread of agriculture over its first two millennia. Before the first stories of the Bible came to be told, agriculture had spread fairly widely throughout the Middle East. It started independently in China a couple of millennia later. Agriculture easily spread east and west. There were fairly contiguous patches of arable land where the same crops would grow and the same animals could be pastured, stretching across Eurasia. There's a lively debate about the extent to which it spread by other people copying what the agriculturalists were doing and where the agriculturalists displaced hunting and gathering peoples. DNA evidence seems to favor copying. Within the first few millennia, agriculture had spread from North Africa through India and Southeast Asia up the Chinese coast toward Japan and Korea. Agriculture got a later start in the Americas. People had not arrived across the Bering Strait until 15,000 years ago. The initial population was small and there were lots of large animals to be eaten. The Americas have a general north-south geographical orientation. The tropics stood in the way of the exchange of ideas between temperate regions. Agriculture seems to have sprung up independently in Peru and Mexico. The lands connecting those two points of origin define the civilizations of the Maya, Inca, Aztecs, and their precursors. Although Indians elsewhere in the Americas were growing crops of some sort at the time the Europeans arrived, their so-called Indian gardens tended to be seasonal affairs planted and harvested by the still nomadic Indians. Much of North and South America, like Australia and Sub-Saharan Africa, remained without any agricultural civilization. 
the human population had grown significantly and undergone a great deal of evolutionary pressure in the 50 millennia since leaving Africa. The rate of progress had accelerated rapidly. The groups that had experienced the most pressure, primarily by moving to cold climates, had made the most evolutionary progress. Circumstances had forced them to develop sewing and weaving to make clothes, houses to stay warm, and to adopt more cooperative, less contentious social orders. Let's recap where mankind stood at the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago with regard to our technology, travel, communications, inventions and materials, warfare, trade, urbanization, intellectual advances, and religion. People were well familiar with how plants reproduced. They knew which plants were useful and they were in the habit of throwing seeds where it would be convenient to find food later on. Dogs had been domesticated a few millennia previously. They were useful in hunting and would turn out to be useful as well in herding animals. Our technology had advanced quite a bit over the time since some branches of Homo sapiens had migrated out of Africa. We had invented fish hooks made from bones. We had learned how to tie our sharpened rocks and bones onto sticks, making hand axes and harpoons. We had learned how to make boats. Ancestors of the Australian Aborigines and Polynesian peoples had crossed stretches of open ocean. Nordic people used boats to hunt reindeer, fast on land, but sitting ducks when they're swimming. We learned how to fight with spears and bows and arrows. We learned how to trade between tribes of people. Obsidian, native glass, comes from volcanoes. It's only found in certain regions. It makes excellent arrowheads, which have been found a long way from the sources of obsidian. It has to have been by trade. There is strength in numbers. Kin groups had grown into tribes and nations. We needed to keep track of stuff. People had started using tally sticks, maybe not as pretty as the one in this picture, with notches to represent the size of a debt. We started to be superstitious, to believe in things beyond our immediate experience. This picture of a fertility goddess is from 25 millennia back. People knew they were mortal. They had funeral rites. They believed in the immortality of their tribe. They appear to have believed that magic could give them a successful hunt. Choosing pigs as a starting point for a history of agriculture is quite arbitrary. After tumming dogs for protection and hunting, humans tamed a number of herbivore species useful for food, fur, and milk, bit by bit over several millennia. As humans migrated out of the tropics into zones with well-defined seasons, saving food for winter became more and more important. Drying food was one of their more significant innovations. Crops were domesticated from wild plants people had grown accustomed to eating. What they call the eight founder crops of the Fertile Crescent all appear about the same time in the archaeological record. The grains include barley and two types of wheat. Legumes include lentils, peas, chickpeas, and vetch. The last, flax, is useful for both oil and fiber. Agriculture presented men with the delightful problem of having enough food that they could store some for future consumption. They invented granaries to keep their grain dry. They made friends with cats to keep the mice down. The fish hook had been around for a long time prior to agriculture. The fish net was even more productive. The same woven fibers in the form of string and rope were useful in making traps and snares to catch animals. Agricultural civilizations appear to have sprung up independently in China based on millet, rice, and soy. The adoption of bananas and other fruits in the tropical world changed human culture, but did not lead to societies based on agriculture. While men had long ago invented boats, it was not until they learned how to work with textiles that they could fashion sails to use the wind to move them. The innovations just named caused men to specialize in certain tasks. They developed professions. Some became good at farming, others at herding, others at curing animal hides, and others at storing grain, and some became good at sailing boats. Unlike tribal people, they were no longer jacks of all trades. People of different callings gathered together into towns for both economic reasons and mutual defense. People of 
Towns required a major change in mentality. Primitive men like apes tended to hold the size of the tribe down to 150 or so, the Dunbar number of individuals a single person can know by personality. You could not know everybody in a town of 5,000. It took significant evolutionary adaptation to learn how to interact successfully with strangers, to take advantage of their talents while not letting them take advantage of your naivete. Long distance trade also involved dealing with strangers. The stone adze blades shown in this picture were crafted in the mountains upstream along the Danube and traded to the farmers downstream. Picture the skills required, language, navigation, knowing the relative value of products being exchanged, and certainly how to fight off bandits. The flatlands of the Fertile Crescent did not offer much in the way of lumber or rock for building. They used what they had, dirt and straw, to make bricks. These improved over time. The world's first great cities were built of brick. People in the Americas had been eating wild forms of corn and potatoes for millennia prior to the time they became dependent on them as a primary food source. The American Indian civilizations emerged only three or four millennia ago. The primary domestic herbivore they used for food was the guinea pig, hardly comparable to the cow, sheep, or pig of the Eurasian continent. American civilizations were highly communal. Property and food appear to have been held in common. Trade was therefore among villages and nations, not individuals. This twist of evolution was to leave the Native Americans singularly unsuited for participation in the highly individualistic European-style civilization. This is evident even today in the sad condition of reservation Indians from Hudson's Bay in Canada south to Chile. Donkeys came into use for long-distance trade in Africa and the Middle East. They appear to have been freely bought and sold and spread widely. Contrast this with the only American beast of burden, the llama. Llamas live only in the Andes Mountains. Moreover, the Inca nation carefully controlled llama breeding and trade. The paucity of navigable rivers, beasts of burden, and ocean-going watercraft in the Americas significantly hindered the spread of ideas. Innovations from Europe could not cross the Atlantic. Similarly, the Sahara Desert impeded the spread in Africa, which developed no agricultural civilization. While early man knew about metals, they existed as a mere curiosity. There were no useful amounts of anything other than gold or silver to be found as native metals. Then came copper smelting, probably an accidental discovery associated with baking bricks or pottery. It led to innovations in transportation, architecture, and warfare. Tin was discovered not long thereafter. After a few centuries experimentation, it was found that bronze, a 10 to 1 mixture of the two, was ideal for making weapons. Whereas copper is widespread, tin occurs only in a few places. There was soon a lively long-distance trade in metal ingots. It appears that potters used simple wheels for a millennium or so before somebody figured out how to fix them to an axle and use them for transportation. No doubt the availability of metal made it easier to craft a working wheel and axle. Not coincidentally, money and accounting appear to have been invented about the same time depending, of course, on one's definition. Certainly, the emergence of new goods for long-distance trade created a need for both money and accounting. Not that men need an excuse to go to war, but the wealth that could be accumulated through agriculture and trade obviously presented a tempting target. Bronze swords were put to use, followed by shields, war horses, and fortresses. Ur, the world's first city with an estimated population of 60,000, is a testament to the agricultural richness of the Fertile Crescent. It witnesses the development of transportation adequate to provision such a large population and the advantages proceeding from the specialization of professions among them. The Bible tells us that Abraham, the patriarch of the Jews, was born in Ur. Horses and oxen, originally domesticated for food and transportation, were obviously stronger than men. Even before the invention of the plow, people learned to use them to haul heavy loads. The invention of the wheel speeded the process up. 
Our Eurasian ancestors had to evolve to manage the changes they were making to their physical, social, and work environments. Oral accounts of life in these times were passed down in the first books of the Bible. The Mediterranean, Black, and Red Seas are protected enough to navigate and bounded by agriculturally productive lands. From the days of the Fertile Crescent, they provided avenues for the exchange of goods and ideas. The Phoenicians became master sailors, using both sailing and oared vessels. Iron must be smelted at temperatures higher than are required for copper. Discovering that the addition of carbon was necessary to make it truly useful took a while. The resulting steel, both harder and more abundant than bronze, had an even greater impact on technology. Slavery became strongly institutionalized as societies grew. Richer societies had more use for a working underclass and better means to hold them in captivity. Writing evolved in a series of small steps, starting with pictures and tallies, then evolving into a vehicle for communicating ideas. Cuneiform tablets in Mesopotamia were used for accounting records and to chronicle political activity. The plow and the use of draft animals brought more land under cultivation and made it more productive. The abacus facilitated trade by making arithmetic faster and more accurate. Invented in China, it was widely used long before Arabic numerals. There were no algorithms for doing arithmetic using cuneiform, but people could drive the sums on an abacus and write them down. The Jews, Zoroastrians, and others came to believe in one God. They believed that God laid down rules for human conduct, enforced by both rewards and sanctions. Religious principles encouraged people to work together in larger social organizations. It promoted evolutionarily advantageous beliefs, such as the belief in having children and raising them to embrace the same religion. Akkad of Sargon is credited with creating the first empire in Mesopotamia, about eight millennia after the dawn of agriculture. To do so, he needed large armies, the means to feed them, money to arm them, and communications to control them. It took people with a vast number of different skills to run an empire. The richest, smartest, and hence the ones whose children would drive evolution were no longer the agriculturalists, but the city people. As written records became more commonplace, parchment made out of animal skins and papyrus came into widespread use. The level of violence in society decreased with increasing levels of civilization. Human and animal sacrifice diminished. Christ's message of brotherly love and a benevolent God was suited for a more peaceful world. The size of political entities in which a relative peace prevailed grew, the biggest being the Roman Empire, where Pax Romana prevailed. Reading and writing became commonplace. The works of Roman authors are still with us today. China and Japan were usually politically unified. Power tended to be held by mandarins selected for their intellectual ability. On the other hand, ideologies drove the dominant powers in the West. The Christians and Muslims each believed they were serving an all-powerful God. The altruistic Vikings believed in their culture and their people. The individual subordinated himself to the larger interests of his tribe and people. Vikings were fearsome warriors, dominating lands as far away as Ukraine. The Christian world fell into separate kingdoms after the fall of the Roman Empire. Despite Jesus' message of peace, they continually fought one another, making warfare increasingly deadly through the inventions of the stirrup, the longbow, and other things. Accelerated evolution is most visible in the plants and animals we use for food. Few even remotely resemble their wild ancestors. Consider also the huge differences among dogs, all descendants of the wolf. The physical differences among people that have emerged since agriculture, blue eyes and lactose tolerance, for example, are remarkable enough. More remarkable is the softening of our temperament, making it possible to live in large communities of strangers. We became used to steady hard work, not the episodic exertions of hunter-gatherers. We learned to control our impulses and to plan for the future. 
Perhaps the greatest evolutionary change has been the development of a level of intelligence sufficient to grapple with the environment we have created. Intelligence is a major factor in selecting a mate among people like the Jews and Parsis who specialize in intellectually demanding work, like trade and finance. Throughout the age of agriculture, the major force behind human evolution seems to have been evolution itself, technologies that allowed the most capable members of society to prosper and raise large families. The theme of continually improving intelligence and temperament persisted well into the last millennium. Evolution, however, is a blind process. Starting with the Enlightenment, philosophies and technologies emerge that appear to have been in the process of reversing these trends. This has resulted in a lot of hand-wringing concern for the future of humanity, most of it cast in moral terms. The next video will apply an evolutionary analysis to the same observed phenomena. The conclusion is that attempting to steer evolution to preserve what has been is probably a futile effort. However, we as humans do have the agency to control our own evolution to some degree. All we have is the freedom to choose our mates in a promising environment in which to raise our children. Let's take it. This is the fourth video in the series on human evolution. The theme is that evolution has speeded up dramatically, especially as it applies to human beings. Natural selection operates on genetic differences within a population, which occur due to random mutations. The more quickly the environment changes, the more selective pressure there is favoring some traits over others. Hence, the more quickly organisms will evolve. We humans have been changing our own environment at an ever-increasing rate and have forced our own evolution. Our conceit has been that human beings are the end product of evolution. This was consistent with the Bible, the fact that humans were smarter than other animals, and the worldwide domination of European peoples a century ago. Upon reflection, it's as ill-founded as the view that Galileo debunked, that the Earth was the center of the universe. Religious people still take, be fruitful and multiply, as a commandment, which puts them at odds with secularists who argue that there are too many people in the world already, and that we have a moral responsibility not to have children. The lonely, miserable position is that we, and those who will populate the Earth for centuries to come, are the products of billions of years of evolution. If we think enough of ourselves to want to be represented in future generations, we must have children and raise them in a viable society. Since our society is the model we know, we're best off raising them to be like ourselves. Without children, it doesn't matter. From the point of view that it is an indirected process, evolution began spinning backwards a couple centuries ago. Standardized tests and the evidence of our eyes shows that we are getting dumber. There are evolutionary explanations for what we see as the collapse of Western civilization. Evolution being an impersonal force like gravity it doesn't make sense to attempt to apply moral judgments to what we see or to try to hold off the changes we see coming. The most we as individual people can do is to hope to control the destiny of our own families. This video presents two brief timelines. They trace evolutionary change in human potential, the traits we regard as positive. The first timeline shows that, from the solipsistic human point of view, evolution and human potential tracked each other on an upward path until the Industrial Revolution. The second timeline traces the major milestones in the reversal of the upward trend in human fitness. I start with a brief recap of the significant innovations up through the Industrial Revolution. Agriculture was long established. Although it improved, the innovations that affected human evolution occurred in the spheres of trade, innovation, and advancing knowledge. At the beginning of the millennium, the Christian world was backward. Muslims had the momentum. The Vikings were making incursions all over northern Europe with their longboats. They invented the keel. Their second advantage was an amazing group solidarity fostered by high altruism. Returning crusaders brought with them a flood of new ideas. Windmills had been used in Persia and Arabic numerals in India for quite some time. The first universities were church-oriented, becoming secular over time. 
intellectual life moved into centers of learning. The invention of the spinning wheel facilitated the establishment of large weaving operations in Belgium using English wool. Textiles became a major factor in international commerce. The Hanseatic League traded goods from Dublin to Riga. At the turn of the millennium, merchants had had to travel with their goods. As common people became literate, they used newly invented double-entry bookkeeping. Better records allowed large trading houses to operate on credit and to manage foreign subsidiaries. Cathedrals were the architectural wonders of the age. The Renaissance led to the recognition of individual artists, architects, and craftsmen. We know the geniuses by name, Sully, Palestrina, and Chaucer for three. The Black Plague killed a third of Europe's population. The common men who survived found their labor in great demand. Their status was somewhat improved. The European states were constantly at war. The English, with their longbows, made frequent incursions into France. The game changer was gunpowder. Cannons made old-fashioned castles obsolete. Then came long guns for individual soldiers. Europeans practiced war to the point that their militaries outclassed the whole world. The merchant class came into power, overtaking the nobility and the church. They congregated in towns, which became increasingly independent from the local nobility. Church authority was challenged when the Bible was translated into English. Martin Luther protested against the abuses of the church and Henry VIII broke with Rome. Though done in the name of reforming Christianity, the creation of multiple interpretations of the faith led to the weakening of the faith itself. Portugal, on the periphery when river trade dominated commerce, had an intense interest in seagoing navigation. Their improved ships discovered Madeira, probed the coast of Africa, inspired the ships that Columbus used to discover America, and soon circumnavigated the globe. Dominating East Asia and the Americas, Portugal and Spain became world powers. The printing press revolutionized the distribution of knowledge. Literacy became more widespread, firing the Renaissance, or reawakening. Europeans dominated native peoples and established colonies all over the globe. The major agricultural development in this epoch was actually one of trade. The Colombian exchange brought European crops and animals to the New World, and potatoes, corn, and tomatoes to Europe. England implemented the first welfare system, Henry VIII's Poor Laws. Science and technology took off with the Enlightenment. The telescope and the microscope supported developments in biology, physics, and chemistry. Water, wind, and then coal-fired steam engines provided energy to drive the Industrial Revolution. Mathematics advanced in support of Newton's development of the laws of physics and later Maxwell's laws of electricity. In short, human progress was extraordinary during the eight centuries leading up to the Industrial Revolution. More and more, human advancement was in the realm of the intellect. The Enlightenment, inspired by philosophers, led to major discoveries in mathematics and science. The European branch of the human species, especially, pushed its own evolution by continually modifying its environment. Our European genome evolved rapidly and favorably up to the Industrial Revolution. We became less violent, more capable of living close together in cities. Literate and numerate people, that is to say smarter people, left more children. Europe's population was held in check by the Black Plague, ongoing warfare, and immigration to the New World. Social trends, however, became the most significant factor in holding populations down. The tr these trends have accelerated to the point that populations are now declining, with the smartest people having the fewest children. The following series of slides traces the downward trajectory. By 1830, one Englishman in six was on welfare, the result of King Henry VIII's poor laws. Europe became urbanized. Since Roman times, cities have never reproduced themselves. On the farm, children work. They take care of parents in their old age. 
In the city, children are an expensive burden. Government pensions are more reliable for retirement. The countryside has long since been drained of talented kids to populate the cities. City dwellers often had no choice but to give their children to orphanages, where the death rates were extraordinarily high. Women and men alike worked in the dark satanic mills, factories. However miserable their lives, women no longer depended so much on men. Darwinism found a ready audience. Belief in God, and hence the commandment to be fruitful and multiply, declined after the Enlightenment. With abundant fossil fuels, male muscle power was no longer as much in need. Home appliances lightened women's work at home. There were more clerical positions to be filled in business. Women went to work. Children were an impediment to work. Birth control became a rallying cry a hundred years ago. The devices have become incredibly dependable. White babies are available for adoption only from fairly stupid and careless mothers. The best and brightest of two generations were sacrificed to world wars. Communist governments liquidated all whom they saw as threats, especially smart people. As physical strength was no longer needed, women came to compete equally with men in the workplace. The choice between career and family, career often won. Developed society became deracinated. Urban women had no extended family around to help with children. They faced the unpleasant task of giving up work or hiring expensive, indifferent childcare. Sexual practices traditionally seen as deviant have become accepted, even lionized. The disruption of traditional family structure has been especially damaging to North Asians. Their libidos had diminished over evolutionary time, promoting social harmony and leading them to devote resources to educating children rather than pursuing sex. However, without family and social pressure to marry, they just don't. The same trend is now visible in the West. Our electronic entertainments became more and more diverting, distracting us from flirting, courting, sex, marriage, and children. Marijuana and an unimaginable assortment of other drugs have become widely used, distracting people from human relationships. Women's liberation taught women that individual achievement was everything, and that marriage and children amounted to subjugation to the patriarchy. It was careers that mattered. As people of European stock stopped having babies and stopped believing in themselves, they opened the floodgates for the mass of immigrants from countries with substantially lower IQs. Altruism, which provided an evolutionary advantage in small homogeneous populations, has become damaging to those populations that still harbor it. They have universalized their altruism, applying it to radically different populations, which exploit it and in no way reciprocate. Researcher Helmut Nyberg computes that the combination of immigration and the failure of the smarter members of Danish society to reproduce will bring the average intelligence down from 99 to 93 in a half century, undoing millennia of evolutionary progress. Two-thirds of the population will be dumber than today's average Dane. Only half as many will be smart enough to meet today's criteria for entering college. Evolutionary psychologist Kevin MacDonald, among many others, believes the Jews have an unarticulated evolutionary strategy to weaken their Christian host societies by championing minorities, women's rights, gay rights, and so on. Ironically, the Jews themselves have been caught up even more than Christians in this anti-fertility campaign they champion. Relatively few commit to raising traditional families. When they do, it's often with non-Jewish partners and adoptive children. For all their fulminating about anti-Semitism, this four millennium old tribe appears most likely to be done in by evolution itself. 
We must accept an evolutionary explanation for the bind that society finds itself in today. The aggregate of people pursuing their own perceived self-interest is making our society more dim-witted. Individual self-interest is leading to collective catastrophe. There are no societal solutions. They must be found at the level of the individual. First, a person must decide whether or not any of this matters. It is consistent with evolution to want your own progeny to succeed. Animals and tribal people do it instinctively. We have evolved to a point at which we can rationally consider our own reproductive choices. If you have decided you don't want to have children, we have to respect that decision. The most we can ask is that you recognize that you have no stake in the future of the planet and don't get involved in the questions that will affect that future. Pipe down about global warming. It doesn't affect you. Otherwise, acknowledge that the desire to procreate is outside the realm of logic. You may want to have children because your religion demands it. You may simply be fond of yourself and think that humanity will be better off being enriched by your genome. You have the right to this most personal decision whichever way you go. I want, and I have, children. To maximize the likelihood that they will pass my genome along, I'm doing the following. I live in a homogeneous country where there's a strong sense of family. My neighbors have a stake in my kids' success, and vice versa. I'll homeschool them or educate them in private schools, teaching values consistent with my own. I will avoid the message-freighted public school textbooks and curriculum. I'll raise my kids with the expectation that they will create families of their own. I will teach my children not to apologize for who they are and even to harbor the belief that they're a bit better than other people, more intelligent, more conscientious, better stewards of the earth and their culture. If not, why bother? I will teach them how to be self-reliant. This means being able to make a living, being equipped to live anywhere in the world under any circumstance and not depending on government. The Earth's population is close to carrying capacity, which has been constantly elevated through the ingenuity of the smartest members of society. With fewer smart members of society, coupled with resource depletion, that carrying capacity itself is likely to diminish. We should be pleased that more and more people don't want to have children. It relieves the pressure on the planet and frees up resources for our children. We have to be wary, however. As the developed democracies enter a time of diminished resources, there will be enormous pressure to vote for benefits for the present generation at the expense of rising generations. As parents have a decreasing minority of the votes, it will be a struggle to find resources to raise and educate our children. We have to recognize that the people controlling institutions, such as schools, often don't have much stake in the future. The pansexuality and, immigra and immigration that they advocate affects us, not them. We have to be on the defensive. Lastly, we have to find community. Our clans, tribes, and nations have been broken up. We need to remake them. We need to reestablish neighborhood schools, Boy Scouts, and other such institutions with people who share our values. We need to find ways to share our ideas, avoiding the propaganda of the mass media and circumventing censorship. Most important, we have to ensure that our children will meet and marry people who share our values. Evolution has been through bottlenecks before. Individuals who made it through that narrow window, like the great extinction of 65 million years ago, the Indians crossing the Bering Strait to the Americas, or surviving the Black Death, form a founder generation. Their progeny, fewer in numbers, tougher in body and character, can take new evolutionary directions. I want my genome to be represented in the coming founder generation rising from the ruins of demographic and economic collapse to make a new world.